the statistics of recovery from alcohol addiction are very low. That alone is a miracle. And being able to look in the mirror and like myself, no dealer would come to my house, basically. I didn't have any money. And I just picked up alcohol instead. And I thought, well, this is cool. This is safe. I can just drink. I just decided to just jump in a river, okay? I just decided, oh, fuck it. I'm going to, goodbye. And I did. And someone pulled me out. Welcome back to Lustcast. Today we're talking about drug and alcohol addiction, how it happens and how to overcome it. Eliza Rose Watson will be telling her story. A few years ago, she was a homeless addict, and now she's a successful OnlyFans millionaire. But before we get into that, please like this video and subscribe to my channel. And if you want to support my channel and help me keep making videos, please consider taking out a premium subscription, where you'll also get some bonus episodes and get to ask me anything you like. So back to addiction. Eliza, how's it going? Hey, I'm good. Yeah, I'm good. I'm looking forward to having a chat. Yeah, no, it's a topic that's like really close to my heart because mm. I've had my own battles with, I don't, I never like to call it alcohol addiction because I didn't have a diagnosis. So I always call it a drinking problem. Sure. But whew, it was hard to get over that. Yeah. And I think so many people struggle with all kinds of addictions. Mm. So, and I think for you as well, it's an important topic. Yeah, absolutely. Like I once heard addiction defined as, um, you know, you have your stereotypical addict, don't you? Yeah. The hard drugs, uh, alcohol, they're sat on a park bench, you know, they've got the uh, paper bag with a mm -hmm. bottle of wine in it or whatever. But I once heard addiction defined quite differently and I think it's almost, it's very widespread if you think about it in the way of repeating a behaviour again and again, even though you know it's not good for you. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't do that? In the, I mean, a lot of yeah. people do that. You can you can think a lot wider about, you know, something like that when you, when you term it that way. And I do think, you know, the more I speak about this, the more I realize that people struggle in very similar ways, maybe not uh, as catastrophically, but yeah. Yeah. And the thing I said to you before we started was that I think people would be surprised to hear that someone that speaks like you could be described as, you know, a former addict, because it's something I maybe kind of ascribe as like a working class thing. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I always think that oh, someone that's an addict is below me somehow. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot of stereotypes around it and there's a lot of, um, I mean, it got in the way of mm -hmm. me uh, realizing what I was and getting help. Yeah. I um, didn't know I had a drinking problem mm, until I stopped. Yeah. It's that park bench thing. If you're not on the park bench mm. with a paper bag, then you're not, you haven't got a problem. Like, it's a weird thing like that. Like It's very strange. And it's almost like, yeah, if you're successful and plenty of addicts yeah. are successful, yeah. not just, you don't have to be in like some of quite high functioning mm -hmm. and have yeah. jobs and careers. Yeah. Like alcohol probably brought me to my downfall, uh, mm. but I was a cocaine addict as well. Mm. And uh, you need money to be a cocaine addict. You they can't just be. go together, don't Oh yeah, hundred percent. But all I was doing is I was working. I was making good money. I was in web design. Mm -hmm. And I was making good money, spending it all on the Coke so that I could do the work to spend the money on the Coke. So, mm. yeah, and I was like working in the centre of London. I looked neat and tidy, you know. Yeah, it was almost worse because people, people don't know. Mm -hmm. And like, the easier it is to hide your problem, almost the bigger it grows. It becomes a bigger monster when... I can relate it's to that secret. so much. Like, yeah. I haven't talked too much about my things yet. Oh, I'm really? still processing yeah. it and I don't know how to. But yeah, I, I was successful in my career. I mm. had kind of almost unlimited money. Mm. And so I didn't think I had any problem. Mm. I just thought I was living the life you're supposed to. Yeah. Like you're supposed to be partying a lot. You're supposed mm. to be. I thought I was hedonistic. I didn't think I had a problem. Yeah, I think it's really cool and courageous that you managed to stop before it got to a point where you had no choice. You know, like, I think that's really cool. Yeah, I had a scare, but yeah. it's it's hard to comprehend what happened. I was still yeah. processing it. So yeah. it's like just talking to you today, it's a chance to learn. And I think, you know, a lot of people listening, if they don't have an addiction themselves, mm -hmm. like regardless of what type of addiction it is, um, they'll know someone that does. And Absolutely. supporting that person is a really hard thing to do. Yeah. So I think like that 
it's like what I see as the goal of this conversation mm. is just to help people relate. Yeah, that would be really cool. If even a couple of people could take something from it, I'd be really happy. Yeah, if we yeah. help one person, it's worth Absolutely. it. Absolutely, yeah. So I guess, should we like just go back to the beginning? Yeah. And because um, I think this is like definitely all about breaking down stereotypes. Mm. And like, what was your childhood like? What kind of background do you have? So I was brought up in a very working class family. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think like all families are, have slight dysfunction in them. I mean, we're all just human beings, right? So there was no huge trauma going on there. Um, nothing like that. But I, uh, I was diagnosed as autistic not mm. that long ago, which makes me quite sensitive. Um, That's a recent diagnosis? It was, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. it usually goes, it doesn't get diagnosed in women, does it? No, they... no. And that's a, yeah. But, um, and I see this amongst my peers in recovery from addiction as well. We all share some commonalities mm. and a lot of people like me uh, feel very deeply. Like, so, you know, there was stuff, you know, my mum and dad broke up. They mm-hmm. had quite a uh, tumultuous breakup. Um, there was a lot of chaos, like going back and forward between mum and dad's house. That is not uncommon uh, mm-hmm. in this day and age. Um, but what I understand about myself now um, was that I was very sensitive. And uh, yeah. Do you so, think that's a bad thing? Absolutely not. No. Because like I can feel deep pain, but I can feel deep joy, right? Mm-hmm. It does lend itself very well to masking feelings however I can though because you know hence addiction it's a really quick and easy way to to do that so obviously I did not have that in childhood mm-hmm. um but I would say that about my childhood um and I would say there was always a sense of just not quite being comfy not quite being comfy like it was always about the next thing or the next place I go or the next exam. So I, I was quite academic. I, I got good grades. So that was a bit of like, yeah, but once the first one, then it's the next one. So you were ambitious? I was ambitious. I would call it more restless, just mm. a bit restless. Um, like the typical I, countryside, like want to go to the city kind of thing. Kind of. Yeah. I mean, I grew up in London. Uh, oh, you did? Yeah. So okay. I, I was a city person. Um, oh, there were now I can only look at this in retrospect. Like at the time I had no idea. I was what, 10, mm-hmm. 10, 12 years old. But I was already looking for a little buzz. Because the first thing was the grades, and it was like, yeah, okay. And then I got a little bit older and it was boys. Okay. Yeah. So and you know, it's it's the one is never enough thing. It was in place very early for me. And it what it would, it would just take me out of my discomfort and my 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 sense of just not quite feeling calm or relaxed or comfortable, you know? Where do you think the discomfort feeling came from? It's hard to tell. Um, I work with a therapist a bit now Mm. um, because that's one of the gifts of recovering, right? So like you can recover, you're stable, and then you can look at, why did that happen? Like, so I'm starting to do a bit of that. And she said, if, if there's been a lot of chaos you're always on the lookout. Like you're always on the lookout for ooh, what's, what's, what's going to happen next. There, there's never any internal sense of safety. So, yeah. Yeah. So anything to take my mind off that really. And, you know, yeah, I picked up boys before I picked up alcohol and drugs and that had disastrous consequences. Mm. I mean, you pick up one, that's great. You've got a nice boyfriend. You pick up another one, then everyone hates you, you know, like you've cheated and you're slag and all this kind of stuff. So, that sort of pattern of like, oh yeah, this makes me feel good. Let me do it again. Let me do it again. Oh, now that hurts. That that kind of started quite early. So by the time I found, you know, you, you start drinking at like what? I started drinking at like 14. I think that's quite normal for British yeah, people, isn't it? It really is. <laughs> like especially just, where I grew up. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Um, yeah. Once I start started that, I was- And were your family drinkers? Or? Yes. Yeah. Yes, they were. Um, not like I was. Mm-hmm. But um, yes, there was like alcohol around, you know, around the family and stuff like that. Yeah. And was there anything in like, you know, your childhood or in your background that kind of hinted at what was to come later? I was actually a very promising little kid. Like, yeah? Yeah. I was like a really well-behaved child. Um, I got really good grades, like I said, like I behaved well. 
Um, I suppose a slight hint is that that there was something of it all, you know, <laughs> maybe there is something going on there is, um, again, now I know about my autism, it's quite normal, but yeah. um, when I was little, I would have really big meltdowns, like really big emotional meltdowns um, about little little things. Yeah. Um, but other than that, that I was, I was a really good kid. Mm. Um, yeah. So I think it. What kind of dreams did you have? About what I wanted to be and things yeah, like that when I grew up. Life. Do you know what? I wanted to be a lawyer for a bit. Okay. Until my dad pointed out to me that lawyers sometimes have to represent the guilty people. Okay. And then I thought, oh, well, I don't want to do that. I want to be a radio presenter. That's, so that's cool. what I wanted well, to do. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> hey, realized my dream. Um, yeah, so just, you know, standard things. Um, yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's interesting things. you said radio presenter because it's like, is that, so you like kind of attention? Or did you always like some attention? No, I... <laughs> I guess my dad used to listen to talk radio. Okay. Yeah. I'm, yeah. And he used to listen to a lot of stuff on uh, Radio 4 and things like that. And I just thought they sounded great. And I really wanted to know what they were talking about. And I really wanted to learn, mm -hmm. you know, so, so yeah. Um, yeah. Not so much about attention as I guess. Um, yeah. I guess that's kind of it for that really. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess addiction doesn't happen right away, does no. it? No, it's a, uh, yeah, so. So I guess at first it was just normal or yeah. healthy. I mean, <laughs> healthy. Uh, yeah, I wouldn't call it, I wouldn't call my way of drinking healthy, but British culture is not particularly healthy when it was comes it, to drinking. Was it the typical teenagers getting drunk Absolutely. in the park? Absolutely, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, yeah. um. It was just about back in the day where you could get away with like fake IDs and stuff like that. Or you could hang outside a shop mm -hmm. and, you know, get someone to get the drink for you as long as you gave them a few quid. And um, the first one, the first encounter I had uh, with alcohol specifically was uh, we stood outside a shop. We um, approached a man who I now believe probably was a fellow alcoholic, probably just mm -hmm. a little bit more advanced than I was at that point to go in the shop get us some WKDs, like those little oh, vod yeah. vodka mixer thingy. I remember those. Um, and get something for himself as well. He came up with a neat bottle of vodka and just gave it to us. And we were like, oh, cool, okay. So um, we drank it. Um, immediate consequence. Like, immediate consequence. We were absolutely obliterated. Like, it's the first time we drank. It's a rite of passage though, isn't it? Oh, my God. Like, I kind of appreciate that. It w Yeah, I mean, it was something. I mean, I had withdrawal, shaking, sweating. I was throwing up. I think we like, we uh Did your parents allow you to drink? I think they understood that I was going to do it. You yeah. Know? They understood that I was going to do it, whether they allowed me to do that or not. Yeah, my parents said that they were allowed me to drink, even going to pubs, like well mm. underage, like yeah. 15, well, yeah. 16. Yeah. And their philosophy was that we're going to drink anyway. So they don't want us like getting to 18 and then going crazy then. Yeah. I think that was uh, their strategy with me. Yeah. I, I don't think Not sure it was if a it good strategy. No. <laughs> I get the reasoning. Yeah. But. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, from that very first one, I mean, there was consequences. But when you're what, 14, 15, it's just hilarious. It's just really funny. Yeah. Right? Like we tried to rob a pizza place. And um, the police turned up or something, and I was mooning the police. And the police, the pizza man, locked us in the in the pizza place so that we could get arrested and all this How kind of stuff. How did you try to rob? You mean you just tried to run away with the pizza? I, I guess so. I think yeah. like, we went in and you didn't um, like hold it up or something <laughs> 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 with like what did we have in a tamagotchi or something like? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So from that very first one, there, there was stuff that happened. It was never like oh that was that was a little bit of fun. There was immediate stuff, but yeah, when you're that age, it's just funny. It's just funny. And yeah, yeah. Um, I think what I do remember though, like being this kid who was constantly a little bit uncomfy, very analytical of everyone. Mm. Um, like when everyone was just having a laugh, I'd be wondering, is this girl my friend enough that I can give her a hug or not? Or um, mm. what's the meaning of life? Why are we here? What are we doing? Um, where are we going next? Um, everyone, it, it, I felt a bit different to other people. And I do remember from the very first times I drank alcohol, uh, that went away. 
I was present. Was it like an anxiety? Not so much an anxiety, it's just a really thinking mind, <laughs> like a mm. really thinking mind. I've still got it, you know, I've still got that mind. Um, it's different now. I know because how to use that so now. you seem so relaxed. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'd say I'm chill, but um, yeah, I just have a really active brain. And mm. I was, um, I just felt like I wasn't on a level with other people. Uh, I couldn't connect properly. Um and then I had a drink and you know, alcohol, it, it breaks your neurons a little bit. It, it slows everything down a little bit. And suddenly I felt present and it gave me a, something in common with mm -hmm. my peers. Um, so very quickly we, we became like the record bunch of the school, you know, like, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So that was the first one. And I think that was in retrospect, I can see that was the beginning of my bond, my bonding with alcohol. Yeah, but I you're so impressionable at that age, aren't you? You are. And, um, you know, it's like classical conditioning, Pavlov's dogs, right? That means fun. I'll do that again, you know. And, and you're a different person. Yeah, a different person. And uh, I wouldn't say I'd found the Holy Grail or the answer to my problems or anything like that with it when I first drank, but mm -hmm. it certainly became my little buddy quite quickly. Yeah. yeah. Mm. And so how did that progress? Like, um, Yeah, I found alcohol, started smoking weed, stuff like that. Um the more you do that, the more you surround yourself with people that are doing it. So it's very much what we did, mm. basically on a, a weekend a weekendly basis at least, right? So, which is normal. Which is quite normal, I think. For a British, there's not many British people that don't that do don't. That. Yeah, I think you're absolutely Especially when right. You're young. Yeah, so you know, so that 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 begins the thing. Um, <clears throat> there's a lot of people that can do that and will never ever ever get to where I got to with alcohol. Like mm. I'm not demonising alcohol at all. It's not the substance, it's the person that's using it and why, right? So um, I think, you know, bearing in mind, I'm still this analytical person that's never quite comfy, right? So I'm always like, right, what's the next thing? What's the next thing? I need to be taken out of myself because I'm not comfy in here. So as you get older, you can, you have more freedom. Mm -hmm. Like you can do more things. Yeah, yeah. So I did do extravagant things. Like I picked a job that was kind of weird. What was I, your job? Like I was in the glamour industry very young. Mm -hmm. um, so I picked that because I heard that money will make me happy, right? So I'm like, cool, I'll get loads of that then. Didn't work. That so much. Yeah, <laughs> didn't work. Um, got that boyfriend because I thought that guy would make me happy. Doesn't matter if I lie, cheat and manipulate to get this guy, I'm going to get him because that's going to make me happy. Did it work? No, it didn't. Um, you had to lie, cheat and manipulate. Well, it's just if some something, if someone told me something would make me feel content I would do anything to get that because I never felt it so I was going out doing all these things that all had consequences I mean if you put yourself in glamour modeling very young that's going to have consequences if you lie and manipulate to get a boyfriend you want that's going to have consequences I just I just the lying when you to get a boyfriend is interesting because I've always figured it's men that do that to get oh, a no, girlfriend. We, we do it too. Yeah, 100%. What, what kind of lies and manipulation? Oh, you? like, so I was doing sort of like, you know, topless modeling and stuff mm -hmm. like that. And I met this guy who is uh, part of a Catholic family. Okay. And uh, so he knew nothing about those things. Yeah. Um, and then suddenly he did, you know, so it was one of them. Uh, I moved to a different country. I went to live in Spain. Um I was doing quite extravagant things and, um, you know, to help me cope with the fallout of these things, I already knew that alcohol and other drugs like Coke and stuff like that will help me control my emotions. Mm -hmm. So whenever I grabbed at one of these things that was supposed to make me happy and it all fell to pieces, I, I was okay as long as I had a little bit of vodka and like maybe mm -hmm. a few lines, you know. So that was uh, developing as I got older. Um, but the problem is that, you know, we go through life and we grow physically and hopefully we also grow emotionally. Uh -huh. And we grow emotionally from going through stuff, experiencing feelings, knowing how to deal with them. Uh, I did none of that. I skipped it because I was drinking or using Coke instead of feeling my feelings. Um, I'm, I'm smiling just because it just sounds so familiar. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, it's funny, <laughs> isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, so this is how... Uh, the the bond between me and alcohol, cocaine, anything really. Like, mm. Was there anyone early on that saw, oh, this might be a problem or tried to help, like before it 
like became serious? Yes. Yes, there was. Um, I think you're only ready when you're ready. I mean, now I can look back and be like, yeah, a lot of people told me. A lot of people said, you know, you've got a problem with that. Mm. Um, but it was my view at that time. Yeah, I've got a problem, but it's not a problem. You know, that's just who I am. You know, when really I, to even look at that, to even look at the thing that you've been using to survive and get through life, you can't use it anymore. That was far too scary for my brain to even comprehend. Mm. So instead I'm just like, no, I'm all right, thanks. You know, you know, so yeah, quite a few people did. When drinking, okay, it's legal. So mm. people are not afraid of it. Mm. So no, most of the problem with alcohol is no one ever thinks yes. that they could become an addict. Mm. But with cocaine, say, with it being illegal and, you know, well known as an mm. addictive thing, did you ever think you could be an addict or was there any fear? Yeah, this is, this is the funny thing because, um, uh, you know, once you start doing coke every single day and you were driving like two hours to get your fix and you're starting to think, this cocaine's shit. And mm -hmm. it's not shit. You've just developed such a tolerance. That yeah, yeah. You can, unless, I mean, if you've got two brain cells, you kind of, oh, this might be a bit of an issue. Um, but no, alcohol, nah. Couldn't, couldn't have told you that. I wouldn't have dreamed that I would be an alcoholic. And do you know what? Alcohol is far more dangerous to come off than cocaine. Alcohol kills it kills people in withdrawal. I mm. didn't. I didn't know that. Um, so yeah, uh, the cocaine sent me to hospital a few times. Um, so quite quickly, you know, and your money runs out. You know, as addiction develops, things in your it removes things from you. So I couldn't work as much anymore, and I couldn't afford the coke. And how it's, quickly did it happen? Do you did, how like just to a point? Mm, yeah, it's, it's hard to say when, you know, heavy use. I guess it's like when enjoying something becomes using it for a purpose, right? Like, so if you're just chilling, enjoying, mm. enjoying recreational drugs or alcohol with friends, compared to, oh, bloody hell, I need this. I need this to get on with my day. I'm not sure where that line was drawn. Um, but it was certainly early 20s mm. and I was on the floor, no house, no money, no nothing, uh, ambulances, police cells by 26. Really? And that was alcohol. That wasn't cocaine. That was alcohol. And that's why I think it's so important to get that across. Yeah, you know? I, when I was drinking, I never thought of it as an idiot. I always thought an alcoholic is someone, you know, waiting for the shop to open in yeah. the morning for the... Yeah. Because that's I mean, I did what do I that, saw. But yeah, yeah. And I would always say, you know, I, I'm not an alcoholic or I don't have a drinking problem. I um, just, I can't have a dinner without a nice mm. drink. Mm. I can't. Um, and, you know, I just like to go out. I'm just social. Yeah. This is my hobby. Yeah. You know, being social is yeah. my passion. Yeah, it's so funny because if you look at the stats behind, you know, illness and death caused by alcohol, you would say it's absolutely ridiculous that it's still legal. 10,000 people a year yeah. in the UK alone. Yeah. Like, it's a good earner though, isn't it? You know, the tax on it is big. So there's there's not, I don't believe there is as much awareness as there could be with alcohol specifically and the way it's put across in the adverts and stuff like that. Yeah. Why wouldn't you think that? Like... Mm -hmm. You should see the drinks that get banned from advertising because the alcohol industry they have self-regulation this is incredible that they're allowed to regulate themselves right um but they do it that. they do it so that i had a meeting with them once to sell them some advertising right and yeah they regulate themselves to stop the government regulating them so they kind of right. preempt things a little bit yeah but that means they can get away with more yeah um and they have this cabinet of drinks that they self banned mm -hmm. and they're all like the kind of things that look too fun yeah you know like you know like the test tube shot yeah you know, things like that yeah and some of them like some crazy invention I'm like, i want to try all yeah. of these you know <laughs> they look so cool yeah <laughs> but, yeah but yeah you should see it yeah it's um i didn't know that but it's easy to dress it up as not a problem like say i walked into a bar and i racked up a few lines of coke on the table mm -hmm. everybody be like what the hell are you doing if i order three glasses of wine in a row wham bam wham bam no one's going to bat an eyelid. It's totally fine. I'm no. absolutely fine. You know, again, alcohol is not the, the, the thing that is the problem, but yeah. you can, you, you know, 
it's it can be as addictive, if not more so, than you know any other class A drug, and much easier to acquire. So, yeah. Mm. And so it was the alcohol that was the first addiction, and then cocaine came later. Would you say, or I would say alcohol alcohol accompanied everything. Mm-hmm. So you know everything started and finished with alcohol. Uh, cocaine was my drug of choice initially. Um, but if I didn't have coke, as long as I had a bit of alcohol, I was all right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it was the base of, of everything. People say weed is like a gateway drug, and yeah, it's the, it's, it's the most it's the most chill drug that you can mm-hmm. try. But alcohol very much was like that for me. I would yeah. say for me as well, because mm. I think weed it just puts you in like a different state of mind. Yeah, but alcohol makes you kind of impulsive it does yeah it makes you want to try other things yeah yeah it was a weird one though because um with coke i mean that has devastating financial effects straight away and your heart can go a bit funny and stuff so Mm -hmm. that that quickly no dealer would come to my house basically i didn't have any money um and i just picked up alcohol instead and i thought well this is cool this is safe you know Mm -hmm. i'm now normal i can just drink and uh yeah that was a and you said you got arrested or you were regularly arrested? Yeah. What I was... wasn't always like detained, but I was always picked up by police. I was quite aggressive. Really? Yeah, I was. Yeah, I was. I, it makes me a bit sad actually, because I'm not like that at all. What kind sober. of things did you do? I was just used to attack people, like my loved ones, my nearest and dearest people. Yeah, I did. And sometimes myself, like, you, you know, there's a part of you that is quite sick with yourself, like especially as a woman. Like as you say, alcohol lowers your inhibitions. Mm-hmm. You end up doing some things that I would never do, and you know, there was a part of me that really hated myself after a while because, um, you know, I'm I'm not a bad person. I've got a conscience, and yet I was doing these things. So you end up self harming, like suicide attempts, all these things. Um, really? Mm, yeah. Um, so it was either an ambulance or police car that often. Picked me up. Mm. And this was a regular thing? You never quite knew when it was going to happen. Like, it was like Russian roulette. Like, sometimes I could have alcohol. Like, I would drink daily, but sometimes I would just drink and pass out. Other times I'd drink, I'd end up somewhere I had no idea where I was, or like in a river. Like, it, it's really Russian roulette. You didn't really know. What was a typical day like? Because were you still working at this time? No. No. <sighs> like, yeah. I think um, my last stint at trying a normal life is uh i was doing bits and bobs of glamour modeling i thought i'll go back to uni i'll go Mm. to uni that's what i do that's that's safe that's structure lasted about three months i did get my degree uh, but after that i was just drinking daily it was every day so no i didn't work i it's hard for me to towards the end it was difficult to know what was a dream and what was not a dream um, really yeah you so know, intense just because it got so bad like if you're drinking all day every day you hallucinate like you don't sleep like you go into like withdrawal you go into like dts like it's it it's really odd it's a really odd thing where um, do you get because obviously if you're not working where how do you even keep going because in a way i've always for me personally i felt that su- success was one of the things that enabled my problem yeah well that, and yeah without some success i wouldn't be able to afford to drink every day yeah i mean it depends what you're buying mm. uh, i do think it was sometimes a gift that i was so skint because i had to stop you know i literally had no money sometimes i was still i was still for my family um, really? yeah i would yeah sometimes i would just find change sometimes i steal the alcohol did they know when you I'm pretty sure they did towards the end. I wasn't allowed in the house anymore towards the end. Um, it's a strange thing. Like, you know, I'd, I've heard this, like, it's it's joked about amongst my peers in recovery that, um, you know, we could, we would do anything for a drink. We would, we would get our, we would get our fix. Somehow we would get it. So mm. if you apply that mind to something healthy, like a fitness goal, or financial goal you have that same mind Uh but you can channel it to something good so bring it back to your point 
sometimes I would walk, walk for miles just to find a shop that was open that and that sold that like four pound Glenn's vodka thing. Mm-hmm. Like sometimes I would hang out with a bloke just because he had some alcohol, like, yeah, you know, yeah, or, or drugs. Like if they had cocaine, even better, like, yeah. I mean, you get it's survival at that point. Like it is a survival thing at that point. Yeah, I smiled then just because, yeah, I, one of my fears is that it's harder to be successful now because I don't need to make as much money, you know, in a weird way. Right. <laughs> That's an interesting thing. <laughs> because now I'm so content and I, I spend so little money because I'm just happy. Isn't that beautiful? And like, I think, like, what do I want? I'm like, eh, not much. Isn't that weird? But before, I was going to expensive restaurants every day, drinking uh, like nice cocktail bars, drinking uh, clubs, and every day. Yeah. And my alcohol budget was thousands. Yeah. Per month. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know. I I I, I just don't. It's just like the idea of that, oh, I need to make this much money mm. it just doesn't exist for me anymore. I suppose what you said, which was, you know, I, I want for nothing. I'm very content. That's the reason we make loads of money, isn't it? So if you can get to that bit without making loads of money. Yeah, because I just, I just don't care about yeah. many things anymore. I used to be very mm. materialistic. Yeah. Or like in terms of pleasures, like hedonist, hedonistic thing, mm. experiences, mm. not so much with things. Yeah. Yeah. I mean... Obviously, towards the end of my addiction, I couldn't really do anything. But mm. uh, a bit earlier, it's yeah, it's anything to get out of myself, any outside distraction. Yeah. Uh, and now, my life's actually really boring because a bit like you, it's yeah. I don't really need it now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't really need it now. But I'm sure, like, there's some p- parts that will always be there. Like, I'm a very driven person. I do still like a buzz. Like I do still like to get a buzz out of something. So mm. if I achieve or if I succeed or if I kill that workout or, you know, that's still, that's, that's still a bit there. That's, yeah. There's still a bit of that there. And that can be okay. That can be healthy. I think like. I think so. I think it's very mm. healthy actually. Yeah. I suppose again, it depends how you use it. Doesn't it? Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So how did your family react to seeing you this way? Oh, now I have a loved one that has a close loved one that has struggled uh, deeply with addiction, and so I know now a little bit what, about what that looks like. And again, like it's making me sad because you mean you've I've seen it in someone else now. You saw it before, or you've seen it? You've seen it after? I've I've seen this person well, and I've seen them unwell, mm. and it is um, horrific. It's horrific. Uh, it is, you know, I'm blacked out for most of mine, you know, I'm blacked out for most of it. The whole point is so I don't feel feelings, right? So I'm going through what I'm going through and my body remembers it somewhere. There's, it's trauma in my body, but I don't really remember half of it. Mm. So I don't remember what my, I couldn't tell you what my family must have seen um, until I saw it myself. And um, it's one of the most gut-wrenching things. It must have been absolutely heartbreaking. Uh, it's almost like, watching someone die, but they're still alive. Like you lose the person completely, but they're still walking around. Like It's a very strange and uh, very sad thing to watch. I've seen that with depression, mm. but I haven't seen it with addiction. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I guess it presents fairly similarly. Uh, it, I kind of think addiction kind of is a mental illness. It's, it's, it's a very strange it thing. Absolutely it's, is. Yeah, so I guess it's a, a similar thing. And the saddest thing is you can't do anything about it. Like they tried everything my family did. They would frisk me before I came in the door just to see if I wasn't carrying anything. They would, they put, my mum put me once in a taxi to this rehab. I don't think I made it to the rehab. I think I just jumped out of the cab. I think like, it's the same with all mental mm, health issues. Yes. Is the people supporting, they can't, they can't do, anything. do anything. No, and, and that's a very sad thing. So um, I think in the end, that's why uh, I was told to, to leave. 
I was told to leave. My dad still had me sometimes. I would sleep on his living room floor. He had a small flat, so I'd, I'd sleep there. But he wasn't, you know, it affected him very deeply as well. Um, yeah, it must have been terrible for them to watch. Yeah. And then I think you said you were homeless at some point. Yeah. I mean, I was an aggressive and angry uh, addict. Mm. I wasn't Is that nice. common or is that? Yeah, I think it's fairly common. Like what it is, is fear, right? I'm deeply afraid. I'm deeply afraid. I'm very ashamed. And so the outward expression of that is F off, don't come anywhere near me, yeah. basically. And uh, yeah, so I would attack people. I'd be very abusive towards people. So um, it may have made it easier on them to be like, look, you can't yeah. be here. <laughs> like this isn't, I wasn't the only child. Um, and uh, yeah, so and sometimes I would choose that as well. Sometimes I would just choose that. But, you know, I'd sleep on different people's sofas, I had a boyfriend sometimes, sometimes I didn't. Like sometimes I just passed out in the park, sometimes I hung out in the park and I would stay there. Um, I mean, that's so extreme yeah. to sleep in outside. It's a weird thing. It's a strange thing. Like, um, I think by that point, I was so ashamed. Uh, I didn't feel worthy, really, of being around normal people. And I was strangely very, uh, what's the word? Just, I was very disillusioned by everyone. I just thought, how are you all, can't you see, like, the world is bullshit? Can't you see, like, why you're just pretending it's all okay? Mm. Why can't I do what you're doing? So I was I was disdainful as well as feeling very ashamed when I was around normal people. So sometimes I would choose, you know, to uh, hang out with people like me. Um, I was going to ask that. It's like what you've described so far sounds quite a lonely existence. Yes. But. Yes, it was. Uh or did you have like a group of people that were in the same situation as you? No, I mean, no, I didn't. We were all out for the same thing. Like, so none of us, you know, I, I would sometimes like bump into a random person and hang out with them for a little bit. But we were addicts. We didn't have any need for friendship. We just wanted our fix. So, mm. you know, if... You know, if it benefited that to be with another person for that time, you would. But, but it's not like a real bond. Absolutely not. Like, I think there's a really good TED talk. Um, and it talks about the opposite of addiction being connection. I think one of the main things addiction robs you of is any connection with, with other humans. It's, I, yeah, I, I guess I had like the opposite experience, I mm. think. Um, and I, I don't have heard other people describe it as I, I don't know how true it is but that you know you do need to change your environment and like for me the friends I had also had drinking problems yeah. initially me too because yeah. who else drinks every day yeah <laughs> you know yeah <laughs> it's yeah I suppose yeah when when you asked me that I was thinking about the very end when I was homeless quite oh, okay the time yeah, and stuff yeah. and no so the, when it's ex dream when it's extreme absolutely no one no one yeah. um but you know when it was still kind of fun or i could still like fool myself that doing coke every day and drinking heavily every day was fun yeah but i would say now looking back like where are they now like mm. where are they now like real friends the bond was coke and alcohol the bond was the drug like so yes i had people but yeah we all chose each other because yeah. I had this one friend when I was much younger um, and she was the one that didn't drink or didn't drug in our group. And for some reason, just made me really uncomfortable. I never wanted her to be there. I was like, oh, yeah. it made me realize what I was doing. So yeah, like you said, I would hang out with other people that did it like, did, yeah. did the same as me. Yeah. 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 I know it's fascinating. Like, I just want to address the homeless thing mm. again, because I guess when you think of a homeless person, you assume it's someone kind of living rough and in, in mm. hostels. Mm. And it's something maybe you weren't like no, that. I, it was more just bouncing from place yeah, to place. Yeah, it's bouncing from place to place. Sometimes I did sleep rough. Sometimes I had a sofa to sleep on. Sometimes, you know, 
yeah so it was a bit like that like yeah I never um I never got got uh luckily I, I never got to a place where I was constantly sleeping rough or um you know I think it was a it was a it was a fork in the road for sure uh because crack and heroin and stuff present themselves to you oh really yeah absolutely they do. is that because they're the cheaper or something or Just, uh, they, you know, know if you're hanging out on your own in a park in the middle of the night and you know the people are mm. using like there and for some reason like thank god it it never appeared to me that that would be the way for me but i think yeah, it was a clear fork in the road. I think things got desperate enough for me just before that point, maybe. Mm. And so were there any moments where you think back and just think that you can't even believe you survived it? Yeah. Yeah. Loads. Loads. Um, I remember, like, yeah, one time. Um, I don't even remember who helped but I remember walking out of a pub somewhere. This was not even that, that it was not even towards the end of my addiction. Um, walking out of a pub somewhere. And you know, sometimes, I don't know, like if you decided to stop drinking alcohol, you may have experienced this. Sometimes I would drink and get really depressed because your dopamine levels are messed up, right? Again, nobody tells you that, but alcohol mm -hmm. does that. So this was a really depressing one. I just decided to just jump in a river. Okay. I just decided, oh, fuck it. I'm going to goodbye. Um, and I did, and someone pulled me out. Just someone, someone random pulled me out. It's incredible. So, so there was that one. Um, I've crashed my car, drunk. Like deliberately or? No, oh, accidentally. by accident. And I'm very ashamed to say that. Um, you know, I've woke up in places that were very unsafe for a woman to be in. And thank God, like, Anything can happen. And again, I'm saying this doesn't even need to be when you're deep in addiction and homeless and stuff. This can be like. Just anyone on a night out. Yeah. So. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Some of the things like I've had quite bad falls. Like mm -hmm. I had a x-ray of my head for something completely different the other day. And they was like, you know, you cracked all, this, all, all up here. And I'm like, no. You know, so a lot, uh. of, a lot of times like, yeah, you know suicide attempts that failed like yeah very lucky person yeah mm. yeah no it's i guess i'm trying to just understand like how it it's hard to imagine isn't it like the like looking back now does being in those situations does it give you some kind of perspective on just life i guess yeah what does it give you yeah i think I think often I can forget this because, you know, our society was so wrapped up in, oh, this bill and this and, oh, I haven't got quite this and I need to do this. And, you know, when I'm talking about something like this, um, I can look back and go, wow, <clears throat> you know, this is just alcohol. So the statistics of recovery from alcohol addiction are very low. Um, so that alone uh -huh. is, is a miracle. Um just waking up and having my health and um, being able to look in the mirror and like myself and have repaired relationships with my family members. Those are Maslow's basic human needs, right? Uh -huh. That's nothing crazy like a nice car, you yeah, know? Yeah. But it's given me the gift of like gratitude for those things because I know what it's like without them, I think. Yeah. What's your opinion though, say, because me, I was thinking about this today is uh, last week I was walking down the street Mm. and there's a recovery center mm. nearby and me and the person I was walking with we the way we talked about the people at that recovery center it wasn't very nice yeah um yeah. and even though I've had a problem myself yeah I I put them in a box as this other mm. like this kind of almost subhuman Mm. like this underclass yeah so i was wondering if you have like what you how it's affected your view of um addicts and people that you see in the street or homeless people yeah it's so funny because um like i was saying to you just before this 
like to go to one of those recovery centers mm -hmm. and a cab dropped me off there once and told me to be careful of all the people there because there's druggies in there you know so there is there is that and i don't see that i i just Do you think don't. that's a class issue maybe just a, a, a stereotype issue and a stigma issue mm. um because you know i go to recovery meetings and there are people from all classes yeah you know you get famous people in there you get actors you get, you get all sorts like yeah, really very successful and very highly intelligent people. Like, it doesn't discriminate at all. But what I do think is um, addiction of any form, I mean, even on a, a mild level with alcohol, even if you have a mild alcohol problem, your health starts to go. You don't look as nice in your face. Like you're hungover, so you don't dress as well. I'm not joking, but my hair's grown back. I was even bolder. That's so like, cool. Before. You're not bald, but that's that's I'm, so cool. Yeah, I've got plenty. I'm, it's bold and balding. Yeah, you're but, looking quite volumetric, yeah, quite like it. It's, it's yeah. thickened up, you know, and it's like, what the hell? Yeah. So like, you know, one of those people at the, those recovery centers could have once been a lawyer, mm -hmm. but it strips of you so much that you look a little bit subhuman. Um, yeah, so, it's, it's true. I, I looked sick. Yeah. I was always bright red. Mm. I was skinny and mm. underweight, but I had like a big fat belly. Yeah. And I looked old. Yeah. So, you know, when you see a person who is slightly disheveled, um, you know, probably dirty clothes, like dirty hair, obviously smells like alcohol if they're an alcoholic. Yeah. Um, we tend to, our brains just click into that's not a safe person. Give that person a wide berth. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're, we're, it's a, it's a great leveler, alcoholism and addiction. It brings you all down to the same thing. And we, don't, we don't think it is, no. though, I think, but it, it is. Mm, so, yeah, so it's, so yeah, to answer your question, I, it's nice to be able to see the person. Yeah. And it's also like, it's sad because, that person was once a full human being mm. and um and an now addict, it's taken. they are less somehow not so much less but they were once a fully functioning human being with a twinkle in their eye and mm. hopes and that's sad so it's not so much that i think that addicts are less than i just think it's desperately very sad um and i see that person as, as unwell like you just as you'd see someone suffering from a serious illness yeah i think we don't think of it as an illness though no we, like I say, we think of it as like you say that person they've had part of their life taken removed mm. and you're right there is um some spark missing mm. um i see like i say this i was walking down the street and i don't know how it is down here but where i am um it seems like spice is the big drug yeah that's scary to watch it's terrifying yeah, it and is seeing an old man mm, high and on the street and just not able to move mm. and you're like what is happening yeah yeah and um, it, it, it's hard not to think it's hard not it's i am so far i've not been able to get past seeing them as an addict rather than as a human mm. that's got problems yeah um i think you know, I'm not saying it's uh, not wise mm -hmm. with an addict to potentially cross the other side of the street because I was actually, I was very uh, dysregulated when I was an addict. It wasn't safe to approach me sometimes. I would actually mm -hmm. just beat the shit out of you sometimes. I just would. It's just so hard to imagine. It's That's a weird thing. Um, but I think like when, when you think of the person in a sense of why are they doing that? Like not why the addiction, this is like a direct quote from, psychologist Gabal Mate who talks a lot on addiction mm -hmm. um not why the addiction why the pain I see a person like that and I'm like you must be in so much pain that that feels better to you than just being in reality you know so yeah I think that's I think it's the best way of looking at it because I, I always think that like my background is quite similar to yours like mm. quite nice any trauma very mild mm. Just usual, I wouldn't even describe my family as dysfunctional. Mm. Um, but you do, I do think there was some, you know, mild trauma just from being alive. Yeah. And I think of people that grow up in 
much, much worse situations mm. with genuinely bad parents, mm. with um, all sorts of different abuse mm. from different people and just horrible situations. And like, how do I, I knew it, it? Yeah, it makes sense that they they, they call it self medicating, don't yeah. they? Yeah, and yeah, like from that perspective, you know, that's how I think we should be seeing. Um, addicts yeah i think it would do us all a favor if we did because mm. you chuck a person like that in prison they might clean up in prison they're gonna go out and do it all over again that's costing money that's costing people it's costing our government money like mm -hmm. it's you know it's not a solution um to rehabilitate a person like that and to to help them to help them have a chance at recovery i don't know why anyone isn't even just from a financial perspective which i'm looking at this from because it's the government that decides this stuff right yeah it would cost them a lot less money if they invested in awareness campaigns for yeah uh friends and loved ones and more rehabilitation for for the individual but as we if they were sick like i'm um, where i'm staying all the neighbors they're complaining that the area has been dragged down and mm. that their property prices have gone down because there's a rehabilitation center being built it's a shame and it's like that's it's really hard to change that mindset it is kind of hard but i would put to them okay do you want the rehab or do you want a load of addicts shooting up outside your house which exactly. one man because you can't sweep it away yeah. like you you can't it's so widespread like i, I guess the, their stereotype is that oh they're not going to be rehabilitated they're just kind of going through the motions or whatever you know that, that's that's the, the stereotype is that yeah. once you're an addict it's that you don't recover i think do you know why it, it's a funny one? Because I don't wholly disagree. Like I will always tell me uh, I'm, a, I'm an addict. I am an addict. Mm -hmm. Like I've always been an addict and I always will be an addict. Um, I'm a recovered addict, mm -hmm. but I treat myself. I have, I have an illness. I have to, you know, I have to address that. I have to treat it. You know, I, that's the way I see it. So in a sense, yeah, once an addict, always an addict. But if you don't give these people a chance, how they, you know, we are human. Mm -hmm. And actually quite a lot of people that end up as addicts, just to touch upon what you said about, you know, trauma and stuff like that. They can be people with severe trauma. Um, and the other, you know, the other type of person I meet in my recovery scenarios are, are very intelligent people, just deep thinking people, mm -hmm. people that are very sensitive, people that are very loving and caring, so much so that it hurts them. Um, there are people that actually have potentially quite a lot to give and people that do recover tend to be successful. Like they tend to be successful in what they do mm. um, and will be given the gift of compassion and real empathy for others because of their suffering. So you rehabilitate someone and give them a chance and they will give back to the community not everybody recovers as i say like the the survival and recovery rate is actually pretty low mm. um but it's you know if you look at you know serious illnesses you know the recovery rate is not always 100 percent. with like yeah you yeah. know serious physical illnesses do we chuck them out of the hospital no no <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that well, would be really weird <laughs> yeah. yeah let's talk more about recovery because yeah. Um, like that's the most interesting part mm. for me. Like, I, I don't even know how I did it myself. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. I suppose it's like, yeah, you ask me questions, but like... I don't have a... I, I say I'm still processing what happened because I think it's easy to give a reason and tell yourself that story, but mm. it not be the real reason. I know I felt incredibly afraid of where I was going and somehow... I decided, okay, I'm not going to drink anymore as a so challenge for say, until I do this, I'm not going to drink. Mm -hmm. But I just was lucky. Yeah. And I felt so good. I, everything improved for me so much that I was afraid of drinking again. Yeah. I was afraid to have one drink again because I thought, and I think I'm still recovering my life. I'm in a situation similar to you where I feel like I was a child still mm. at 37 mm. and now i'm becoming an adult mm. and maturing emotionally yeah. and learning how to interact with people yeah. and how to do good things yeah. sometimes yeah what do i even like yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah really because i don't know if you experienced this but when i stopped drinking 
I was so fucking bored. Yeah. I didn't know what to do. Yeah. Because I didn't want to hang out with my friends because they were drinking. Yeah. And you have no idea what I, you like. I googled why is not why is life so boring when yeah. you're sober, and it said because you're boring. <laughs> Yeah, I, yeah, I think like you but said. My life was just drinking. Mm, yeah, exactly, because, yeah, like when you take that away, you take my whole identity away. Yeah. Now, not only am I bored, I'm in grief for like my life. Like, yeah, and the fear of missing out yeah. is a factor. Yeah. It, but it's like missing out on what? Well, exactly. I mean, if you look at it, really, if you play the tape forward just a few hours. Hmm. Yeah, there's always like a highlight. Like I've got some memories which like they were so fun and such yeah. a thrill. But if I add all of them together, it's maybe 10 yeah. nights yeah. out of 20 yeah. years. Yeah. But you're always going out yeah. thinking that there's going to mm -hmm. be this incredible movie-like experience yeah. of a night out. Yeah, it is so funny. Like they did a experiment on rats mm -hmm. and they found that there was a certain group of rats that w were addicted to pressing this lever to get food. Mm -hmm. And they were the group that only occasionally they got the food. And it's like, but that, that one night, that one night, it, that was so good. I'm just chasing that feeling again. Mm -hmm. And like literally my whole drinking and drugging story is literally chasing me, me chasing like three good nights. Just yeah. the same as the rats, just like maybe this time, maybe this time, you know? So very much like that. Like, yeah, you're, and like your whole nervous system is screwed. If you drank every day for a while or even heavily every weekend, that's another thing. They don't really, you know, people don't know that. Like your uh, serotonin and dopamine, which is your happy chemicals and your reward chemicals, they're, on, they're, they're absolutely screwed. So mm -hmm. you're not only bored, but you're also probably a bit depressed. <laughs> like, <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, I remember when I was drinking, I thought I was a happy person, mm. but um, so I'm still going through the process, but after i'd say after one year of not drinking i went from having maybe three or four happy days a month to having like one or two sad days every three months that's amazing and that's it, so cool. it the, and i like, realize now that like it's normal to be quite happy yeah like, even when something bad happens like it doesn't it shouldn't yeah. affect you in a crazy yeah. way or get your mood down yeah it's, so it's like just a complete inverse of what life is. yeah yeah, I think that's so, like, important that you said that because it's like, you know, I was like maybe, what, one week, two weeks sober and I was like, well, this is shit. This is shit. Even months in, I was yeah. I was just, I think it was harder mm. once I was sober mm. than I was just, what do I do? Yeah. Yeah, and, like, you know, for anyone going through that first bit, life isn't really like that. It just looks very grey because you haven't, grown all those neurotransmitters back yet just give it some time i would always just say just mm. just wait it out like you said like it does get a hell of a lot easier on the uh on the mood front and stuff and um yeah getting all like you know the other thing about drinking a lot and you know you don't have to be an addict you don't have to be homeless whatever like drinking using drugs doing anything like outward for gratification you, you're kicking your feelings down the road, but like mm -hmm. you're not really feeling your full feelings. So like the other thing that happened in early sobriety for me was like, I was literally like, like this with my emotions, like very much like, whoa, what's going on? Like, and actually I was just feeling my feelings. Like, I was just mm -hmm. feeling my feelings. Like, like you said, like I can now have a bad day and it's not even that bad. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a very complex thing mm. and like I said, I don't understand it. So yeah. you know, talking to you, it's helping me understand oh, it. Oh, cool. It's yeah. like really. Um, so was there a moment, like what sparked this need to change? Did you like admit you had a problem or what happened? Yeah, I think now looking back, now the denial has lifted, you know, as in mm -hmm. there were multiple ones of those. Going back to like, at age 22 oh really three yeah i remember once being on like the floor of like this house we'd done a house party it was an after party we'd been sniffing coke till like i don't know what I mm -hmm. and i just couldn't stand being in my own skin and i just thought this this is horrible i don't want to do this anymore of course i continued like yeah. there was there was various moments like that um yeah, you don't think of those moments when you hate yourself as a moment of, I need to change. No, because You think scary. it's just a consequence of 
yeah the fun like oh, i had the fun now i have the pain yeah it's it's a it's a you know i think like a lot of people i've heard it called the gift of desperation <laughs> when you truly have nowhere else to go then mm-hmm. you will face the fact that you need to change i mean obviously you said it was a bit different for you you were saying about it earlier and like you were able to be like you know what this is crap like i need to you know mm-hmm. um but there were multiple moments like that uh i was very lucky in the sense that on one of the it's kind of windows for change so it's really desperate moment for you like this is i cannot do this again i cannot do this anymore and uh during one of those opportune moments of just uh someone reached out to me and i only even spoke to her because i was too scared to be my by myself that was all like that's the only reason i bothered to speak to her i was scared of my own company and um it was a friend or someone close it was actually a work colleague of my mum's wow yeah so you know i had I hadn't had much contact with my mum or anything like that. Um, but she must have been at some point speaking about me. And this colleague of hers disclosed that she was a recovered uh, addict. Alcoholic. Wow. Um, yeah. So she turned up. And I only let her in because I'd scared myself, like maybe the night before, mm. one of those police ambulance, whatever kind of moments. And I didn't want to do it again. And I, I let her in to the house and we spoke and that was the beginning of my recovery. Connection, connection. Uh. Yeah, so that was a real uh, gift. Like one, me being desperate enough to so listen. So if it wasn't for knowing her, would you still have got the help, do you think? Who's to say? Um, you know, one thing, it's actually very difficult to find the right help. It's mm. really difficult to find the right help. Like you walk into a doctor, which I had done. I'd done this many times. I've had, that's the problem. I, yeah. I said the reason I've not been diagnosed is because even, I mean, I was living in a foreign country mm. for one. Mm. And I was thinking, okay, try and find a psychologist. And it's like, what type of psychologist do you want? Mm. Is it a therapist? Is it mm. a psychotherapist? Is it like, and what style? Like, it just how do you pick them? Yeah. Like, all I can see is their name. Yeah. Like... like yeah. What like, am I asking for? What am I telling them? Well, yeah. And quite often you go to someone like that. They won't even ask you the right question. They won't ask, They won't know. They won't know to ask. Like, you know, they'll ask if, you, if you're feeling depressed, but they won't ask how much you drink. Do you use a lot of regu- recreational drugs? Well, that has a huge effect on whether you're depressed, right? Mm-hmm. So, yeah. So I, you know, maybe it would have still, maybe I would have still got help. But I remember I've been bouncing around, you know, GPs and, counsellors and you know but prior to that for quite a while uh you know I wasn't at that point it was a bit late but um you know it's it's I think it's there's a lot more awareness about it now um but maybe I I still would have reached reached for help at some point but yeah I think it's the knowing where to actually go what did she say to you that other people didn't say before she she got me like she really got me because um, she'd been through it yeah okay and um she was this respectable looking woman i think she just come straight from work or something i mean she looked normal and yeah well, that's the thing like you, i said like people are not gonna almost believe that this was you yeah um she looked like one of those people that i wish that i could be like, mm. you know, you're curtain twitching at 5am w- w- watching these people like happy walking down the street, going to work. And you're kind of like, well, fuck you. But you're also kind of like, I wish I could be like that. And so she turns up and I tell her some of the things that I've just done. And she kind of laughs. And she's like, yeah, I remember that. You know, <laughs> oh yeah, I remember that one. You know, I haven't drank for X amount of years and I haven't used drugs for X amount of years. And I was like, oh. And I think like, you know, what I feel like the whole thing feeds on, and I don't know if you had this, this experience, but it kind of feeds on shame and secrecy. Like, ooh, like you don't think anyone else understands. You don't really want to talk about these things either. And I, yeah, I never had that because I, I never believed I had a problem mm. until this turning point. Yeah. So I didn't experience that. Yeah. I, didn't, I was proud. 
I was proud of the lifestyle I was yeah. living. Like, yeah, yeah I, had you, I, thought, I think too. people would like wish they were me. Yeah, I thought, yeah. I thought, obviously, they wouldn't. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? Like, yeah, but yeah, I think it, it broke down some of that isolation. Mm. And um, there wasn't anything she said. It was more just that she listened or that she'd been through it. She'd been through it, mm. and she was living proof that you could go that far and you could come out the other end. Mm. Yeah, and. Um, yeah, I was desperate enough to to listen to her. You know, give me a few more days. I'm like, oh no, no, I'm all right. You know, but at this point, I was like, oh my god, like, you know. So yeah, I listened to her. Um, and what happened next? She took me to a peer support group. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and again, I only went because I didn't want to be by myself. So this is like AA, or is yeah. it different? Yeah. yeah, yeah, I went to AA, um, and I still go to twelve step groups now. Mm. Like, I can I use twelve steps for most things in my life, like. You know, but um, yeah, so suddenly I met a bunch of people who were actually just like me. Like Mm -hmm. I was no longer this like, you know, isolated person in complete shame and secrecy. And there was living proof around me that you, and I saw these people, I'm like, you're not bad people. I just thought I was the worst scum of the earth. Do you know what I mean? Some of the things you've done, if you steal from your own family and you beat up your dad and you like sleep with men that you don't want to even you start to think you're a piece of shit. Mm-hmm. You start to think you're not a good person. But I didn't think that about these people. And so yeah. it gave me a bit of hope for myself. Um, and it gave me a bit of awareness as to what it actually was. It's the first time someone said to me, you know, like, you know, what someone with alcoholism is. It's not just the guy in the park bench with the vodka. Like, it's anyone who feels that drink is costing them more than money, mm. you know, like. That's a good description. Yeah, I really like that one. And um, yeah, really simple advice, like really simple advice to, to follow. Like, um, I haven't done the 12 steps, but when I read them, what surprised me was how spiritual they mm. are. Um, I'm not a religious person. Yeah, nor am I. But I saw there was a big emphasis on God, but yeah. not not like any god and that that really surprised me like one of the things that helped me so much was um by accident i just started to relate to bible stories right and it helped me um just take away the anxiety of being awake and alive like just knowing that for thousands of years people have struggled with yeah i did something bad and then today you've got to try and go out and do good. And yeah. um, just understanding that to be human is to be flawed and to yeah. fuck up. And like that helped me so much. Yeah. Like, even though I'm not religious, it just helped me. Yeah. Like having this God or whatever you want to call it as this like kind of perfect ideal that you're supposed to try and live up to doesn't mean you'll succeed every day or every time but to try to has helped so much yeah i'm not religious either um i think when the whole 12 step thing was written it was very much when everyone kind of was um Mm -hmm. yeah but it's kind of anything that's anything that fills that hole in the soul which is why we're just uh, like just consuming everything and becoming alcoholics or addicts or whatever you've got a bit of a hole in soul there and yeah it, it's also i mean you touched on it. it's kind of the same as i got out of the first peer support meeting i say 12 step because that's what worked for me but it doesn't work for everyone everyone's different you know but you've got a sense of like comfort and relatability and like oh you know mm. i'm not the only one like people have struggled with this for years like you know and the the sense of satisfaction you can get out of changing your you know doing something good like you know and is it literally that you do one step at a time like or is it just more these are like the things i I, i've not done it so it might seem like a dumb question but yeah um, i mean i didn't do any steps for two years i'd say i didn't do any steps like you know it was more just the support yeah i mean i did i've done steps since i've done them a couple of times and you know like it's a cool thing um, but I would say like, you know, the main thing for somebody who's struggling with that, whether they're an addict or like 
they just feel like, oh, this is not cool anymore, but I don't really know how to stop it, is finding people that uh, have been through it, you know? Mm-hmm. That's the lifeline. So that's all I really did. I just listened to people and I I learned how to share my feelings with people and I learned, you know, uh, how to manage my feelings, how to manage my emotions, how to live life. You know, you were saying like being, we're like mid thirties and I've got like the emotional capacity in the brain of like a, a 15 year old that's so, exactly how i feel yeah even now i feel like i've maybe reached 21 it's or funny something. it's, it's yeah. kind of cool sometimes because like young at heart and all that you know? exactly <laughs> people are always surprised at like, how like, yeah I, i'm playing with kids uh, like my i've got a little niece i'm playing with her like the children I'm yeah not playing, like, yeah the yeah so do i so do i yeah yeah um yeah uh yeah so i think that that was a real lifeline and like yeah, the steps are really cool too. But you get people that recover in many ways. You know? Were any steps particularly hard? There's a lot of kind of like, I mean, I think it's based on that, the the 12 steps, just like any kind of, uh, I mean, some people go to therapy. Some people find certain mm-hmm. religions like Buddhism and, you know, religion. Some people, it's all self-searching. Yeah. Um, and it's all based on the idea that the this or this or like this or shopping or gambling or overeating or they're just a symptom of what is actually truly going on in here. Like nobody's nobody goes out and decides, right, I'm gonna mess up my health. I'm gonna go and do so much Absolutely. coke that I put myself in the hospital. That's what I'm gonna do. Or like It looks like they decide to do it because people say, Yeah, but you are choosing it. Yeah. But it's not as it's simple not. as that. No. no. And like nobody goes and does that if they're all right in here. No, not really many people. I mean, you get people that overdo it sometimes, but not to the extent that you are damaging yourself and you're damaging your life. And the idea behind the steps, just like there isn't therapy and some religions and other things people do, is to kind of like have a look at what's going on here. Like what's going on inside? Like mm-hmm. why am I doing this? And that can be uncomfortable because, you know, for me, it was alcohol and drugs, but people use sex, people use porn, people use shopping. It's all numbing. It's all like, no, I don't want to look at that. Thank you very much. I'm mm-hmm. just going to do this so I don't feel anything. Um, so, yeah, that that can be uncomfortable. Was there a point where you felt, okay, I'm recovered now? Or is it just you always have to keep working to avoid? Because a lot of people, they, they do relapse, don't they? Yeah, they do. Were there times when you mm-hmm. relapse? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Like, I think in my first year of trying to recover, I, I got about two months at a time. Okay. I got about two months of sobriety, sobriety at a time. Um, but it's a little bit like... How does it feel when you relapse? Shit. <laughs> um, at the beginning, kind Even of... Even when you're doing it? Like, yeah. Like, once you know that you're just not just drinking and using because you want to, and that's who you are, and I'm just a free and easy person. Once you know that you're doing that to to fix your feelings or to hide from something Uh changes the thing completely it changes it completely like it changes the uh vibe um but i think it's one of those things that you know before i tried to recover i had no days of sobriety yeah so i had nothing to compare it to then when you get a little bit of time like i don't know if you had this like maybe the first few days where you 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 would have drank and you didn't like waking up and be like, yes, I didn't do it. I didn't do um, it. The like, thing that helped me was I went alcohol-free, caffeine-free, and I hired a personal trainer. Oh my God, hardcore. Every morning at 9 a.m. So it's complete lifestyle change. And because I felt like I was going to die. Mm. I just had this incredible fear. And I was looking, I had like an Apple watch and I think my resting heartbeat was 120 Mm. per minute. Mm. And I I just really focused on getting healthy. Yeah. Like my mind, my body, um, and having that place to be every morning. Yeah. That routine Mm. helped a lot. Yeah. But I don't, I don't know how I did it. Yeah. And I isolated myself from everybody Mm. because all my, I don't know other relapses because people with alcohol people offer you drinks like i haven't been in london for three years 
I, I'm staying with some friends and they didn't know I was alcohol free now. And I was like, oh yeah, I've been sober for three years. I had a drinking problem. Five minutes later, oh, do you want a beer? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what? Yeah. What? yeah. It's so funny, isn't it? <laughs> oh, but this one's only 2%. Or like, this one's only, I'm like, no, just, yeah. Uh, sometimes, yeah, sometimes, um, you know, um, I think you're right. You do have to change. You have to flip your habits a little bit because your brain's mm. like that. It's got certain wiring. And if you... And even though, even though you say, oh, I had a drinking problem, so I stopped drinking, their habit is just... Especially in British culture, oh, yeah. it's just beer what? and drinks Why for do you not drink? Like, yeah. it's almost like, I remember one of my first little jobs I had when I came back into uh, life, like when I tried to, I was sober. Um, someone said, oh, do you want to come out for drinks tonight with us? And I was like, no, 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 I, it, I, I come out, but, uh, but I don't drink. She's like, well, you're not in our club. And it was almost, she took offense. It was almost like. Yeah, I noticed this more with dating. Right. Um, the, I was in. Because, yeah, I'll, if I go on a date, mm. my dates won't drink because they'll feel uncomfortable drinking with a non-drinker. But it also kind of makes me quite incompatible with them because yeah. they have to change their behavior around me or they feel they have to mm. change. So it yeah. causes problems that way. Yeah, it, it, it's um, jarring to a lot of people. Mm. Like, yeah, it but is. But they don't realize that if if I go out with a group of people and they're drinking... I kind of get high along with them yeah. because their mood changes mm. gradually and they bring me along with them. Yeah. But if I join a group of people who are already drunk, then I can't get on their level. Yeah. There's a certain point of drunkness for me where I'm like, I I don't even understand what you're saying now. I'm fine as long as I've come along. Yeah. But if I join, then no. Yeah. But, yeah. But they don't understand that. So. Yeah. It's weird. It's a weird thing, isn't it? Mm. Like, yeah, I certainly think in my culture there's a, a look of confusion that sometimes comes onto people's face. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think like, yeah, I think with the relapses, I think what you said you touched upon, like people offering you drinks, and I think it was also like going to places that would have been associated with alcohol for me. Now I can go where I want. I can yeah. go into a par bar if I want. Like I can go clubbing if I want. Like it, it doesn't make any difference. But, yeah. But like the first your brain's wired a certain way. Like my brain goes, right, okay, I'm going there. That means drugs and alcohol. Yeah. So when it gets there, it wants the drugs and alcohol. So a lot of times I did that. It took me two years mm -hmm. to get to the point yeah. where I could go to a nightclub. Yeah. Like now I can. Yeah. But. How do you feel like in a nightclub? It depends what nightclubs you go to, right? But the one um, I went to, I was like, are we, have we evolved from animals or, or not? It's just people you, like. You know how I felt? I went and I was like, Oh, it's just a room. Yeah, it's just a box. Yeah. Yeah. But when you're, because I would only ever go to a nightclub when I'm really smashed. Yeah. And it's this kind of trippy place. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, you can just walk around without bumping into people if you yeah. want. So yeah. I was, my, I must have been that guy that yeah. was just, you know, yeah. annoying people. Yeah. Like, yeah, the places I chose as well were very about the drugs, you know, very much about the drugs. And so, yeah. I go there sober and I'm like, whoa what's going on like it's like yeah. oh it's it's, it's actually some, quite weird in here like, i can only go to somewhere if the music is sensational yeah 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 me too yeah like yeah but yeah so there was uh yeah and i like going out in turkey because right. i can drink tea yeah the and they don't they don't care it's normal. yeah yeah, it's yeah. like half the people drink half the people don't yeah and it doesn't matter yeah although i think it's changing isn't it like but he, in England, I think if you don't drink, you do drugs. <laughs> yeah, if you, you can't get water, sober you're automatically on drugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's interesting. So yeah, that's fun. And so when I want to talk about like the relapsing again. Mm -hmm. Were there any times when you thought I can't do this, or when you came close to giving up? Yeah. Because I guess a lot of people do, but yeah. you didn't. Yeah, I didn't give up um, because. I think I didn't give up because when you have got a little bit of, you know, you've got, got yourself sober and you have a little bit of self-esteem and you feel a bit of hope and, you know, you plan to go to the gym or you, you enjoy the weather when it's sunny or you actually hear the bird tweeting in the tree. Like, mm -hmm. I missed that I when I relapsed. Because Where did your motivation come from? Because it, it seems like... I mean, I've seen your Instagram. It seems like you take fitness quite seriously. Yeah. So yeah. there's some inner drive that you tapped into that maybe others 
didn't or can't. I don't know. I couldn't tell you. I think like, for me, I knew I had nowhere else to go. Mm. I had no choice. It was like, I didn't really want to die. Um, sober, I didn't want to die. Um, I scared myself that much. I had no choice. Yeah. Um, and I had no money. I had no, I had, I had no choice. I mean, I'm not saying everybody needs to get that far in order to, to get well, but the other yeah, I mean, thing. I mean, it's the only thing that stopped me was just fear. Yeah. Well, yes. It's, fear. Yes. Yeah. Fear of, uh, when you're in it and you're always like that, you, you just kind of like, you've got nothing to compare it to, but mm. you feel a sense of loss. Like when you've built up some, some life, you know, and you feel all right about yourself and then suddenly you like, you feel shit. So it, that in itself gives you drive and motivation to be like, no, 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 I don't want this. I, I want that, you know. And, um, what I would have said to myself at the time, I did definitely, I felt shame. I felt like, oh, I'm never going to get this. I'm, oh, I'm just worthless, all these things. Every one of those ones taught me a lesson and it was all part of it in mm. the end. It was all part of it. it all, all it did is solidified. I didn't want that life anymore and I want something different. Yeah. So, yeah, it's really important. Like, not many people will, will I mean, some people can, like, and some people do, and, and that's amazing. But a lot of people, it takes a while to rewire your brain, especially if you've been doing it since 14. Like, it takes yeah. a while. I, I guess I was quite lucky because of having some financial freedom. It meant I could isolate myself. Whereas yeah. for some people, they don't have that luxury. Mm. They'd have to go to work, maybe risk going to the pub after work. Or yeah. I think like support of peers helps as well. Mm. Um and, you know, I learned everything the hard way. I swear to God, I'd learn everything the hard way. They say, don't go into pubs or bars. You'll probably pick up a drink. Don't don't go in there yet. I was like, all right, thanks very much. Went straight in, drank, right? So like those things or like, you know, don't don't get into a relationship in your first few months because that's an intense feeling. Those, those are intense emotions and you, you might need some time to learn how to process those. All right, thanks. Went and did it anyway. You know, so like yeah. it. it it all, yeah, I guess it's like any, like people go to weight loss groups and they go to smoking cessation groups. It helps because you're not alone, uh -huh. you know, you, you're never by yourself. And um, yeah, so that helped. And I would say to anyone that's um, given it a go and then failed. Um, and this is any type of addiction, I think, we're any, talking about. Yes, we? I would say that's that's just not a failure. That's just not a failure. I look back at my ones now that I felt were failures and I needed every single one of those experiences to mm. eventually uh, be free from my, my addiction. So I guess if you think of it as a failure, that's maybe what can make you give up Yeah, because it's like, okay, I failed. I can't do it. Yeah. Although, Whereas if it's like, okay, I tried, but I need to change something. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not just saying that to be trite as in like, it's not a failure. It's not like a cute little no, Insta I, I, Instagram I, I caption. I completely get yeah. that. Yeah. Like it, it really isn't a failure. It's just all part of the thing. I, I didn't, like, yeah, before I spoke to you, I was thinking a relapse is a failure, mm -hmm. but it I can, get how it isn't. Yeah. You can, you can, like, it's the same as anything. Like, you know, you go through shit times in life just because you get sober. It doesn't mean you have like this beautiful life where there's just butterflies and rainbows everywhere. Mm. Shit happens. Like, you learn from all of it as long as you get through it, right? So any any bad time you've anyone's had in their lives, when, it's, when you're in it, you're like, oh, my God. Like, But when you get past it, you look back and you go, yeah, I learned this, this, and this, and I would do that differently next time. Or Did you quit completely, or were you able to get to the level of social drinker? No. I'm really all or nothing with so, mostly everything. So, yeah. <laughs> no, it's I tried it that a bit, and, you know, sometimes I would succeed in having just a couple of drinks or, like, yeah, maybe a bit on a spliff or like, you know, but my mind would constantly be, I would be trying to control it. So I'd be like, right, after two, I'm going to, normal people don't have to do that. Like the people without problems don't regulate themselves when uh -huh. they're drinking and they don't have to, you know, stop themselves from obsessing over the next drug or whatever. It's just easier just to not. And actually I'm just, I'm a happier person, you know, like, do you find, um, did you find that reality, like I say, was quite not a nice place to be for a while? Yeah. But then, like now I guess you get it and it's more fun somehow. 
Yeah, I suppose it's like you just build resilience. It's like riding a bike, right? So you're mm-hmm. a little kid and you get on the bike and it's horrible. And you think you're going to fall off every two minutes and you lose control of the bike and you sometimes fall off and you cry. And But you keep getting on the bike and then suddenly you're just, it's a breeze, you're just cycling. So I think it's that. I think often I had to just remind myself of why, of what was around the corner if I chose to escape reality again, what what that was truly like. And that was really awful. So again, support of others. Like I couldn't have done it by myself. I needed to. Who did you need? Yeah. So I, I have my peers in my, my 12 step groups. Um, I had a couple of close friends that stuck around. Um, That's really good. It, it, yeah, it is nice. I mean, Support and understanding of people that have genuinely been through it. Uh, you trust them, like you trust them. And um, it's, it can sometimes just take phoning or connecting or texting someone like that and saying, I'm having the fucking worst day. This is terrible. And I really want to use drugs or I really want to drink. And they might reply, yeah, I've been through that. Yeah, it will pass. And do you want to chat? And mm. that can totally replace the the drink or the, the drug. Yeah. It's... Even now, I like on a hot day, the thought of beer, it's so tempting. Yeah, it's just a little... Um, yeah. It's your brain's wired, like, you know. Did you find any tricks for kind of getting past it? Yeah, um, I learned a really good one, and it's play it forward, as in play the tape forward, as in so you're there on your hot day or like, you know, what's one of them for me? Um, on the train home from a, a job. Um, oh, I really want to, you know, just a glass of red wine, something civilized, mm-hmm. you know, play it forward. Yeah, but it's not just going to be one red wine, is it? Mm. It's going to be five red wines, a bag of cocaine, a bottle of vodka for the next three or four days. So that really helps because it brings you back down to like reality and sometimes just um, doing something else to satisfy your craving. So what are you really craving? Like you're really craving the the drink or the drug or are you craving, say, me on the train home? Comfort, relaxation. I just, I want to feel like cuddled. I want to feel calm. Like mm-hmm. meditation music, bringing a nice cardi with me and cuddling it around myself. I mean, if you're used to snorting cocaine and like doing shots, it's never going to be as instantaneous as that. But that's a helpful one because it just allows that craving to pass you know yeah my one was um drinking soda water yeah that's a good one because you feel the feeling on your throat and stuff don't you right my my friend who quit drinking alcohol we like before me he taught me that yeah that's great it's the only drink if you're a beer drinker and that's your main drink it's the only thing that can give you that crisp, refreshing, bitter flavor. Mm. And just using that as a substitute whenever you have a craving. Yeah, that's that, a really cool idea. That just, save without that, I wouldn't have been able to stop. I don't yeah, think. yeah, 100%. And like, you know, with, with you saying about soda water, it's kind of like, still treat yourself to things. Like, mm your body is craving serotonin right and dopamine because i'm used to giving it myself so fast it doesn't even produce it by itself anymore right like so chocolate nice drinks that you really like that are not alcoholic Mm. um treat yourself more than you would normally with other things that will still make you give give yourself that those happy hormones i suppose Mm. yeah and so how did your life change once you started to get sober too slowly for me too slow yeah i was bored shitless and i was annoyed and i was like well this is well, why haven't i got any friends why haven't i got a job it's incredible isn't it it's... yeah I, I, mean, I want it now thanks like i'm a drug addict and an alcoholic i want the feelings now i want the result now it's so interesting you said do you think that's maybe one of the reasons why you became like that because i'm like that i always i'm so impatient yeah i want everything instantly yeah yes um but yes. Um, so yes, my life was changing while I was whinging about it not changing. And then one day I just looked around and I was like, oh, huh. Yeah. Huh, I've got a little car. Mm, I've got a little job. I've got a couple of friends. Wow. Was it easy to rebuild relationships? Surprisingly a lot easier than I'd pictured. Um, sometimes some 
never were rebuilt, um, but those were replaced by other ones. Mm. Um, yeah, so all the while I was sitting there whinging about why isn't anything changing? Are you you guys told me this would get better. You know, I was, then I looked around and, hmm, you know, wow, okay. And those things feel like real achievements, like, yeah, don't they? Like, you know, like, it's the little things that make the difference as well. It's just like being able to be consistent, being able to show up and do things when you say you will. That's the thing. You have so much free time yeah. when you, yeah. when, because it, because it, you do, it dominates you don't your realize, life so yeah, much. Yeah, you don't realize it? how so, much time it takes. And it's like, what do I do yeah. after work? Yeah. Mine was obviously gym. So was yours, right? You said, yeah, like, right. You mine was like, that was my morning. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it it changed fairly quickly. Mm. Yeah, and then he moved into OnlyFans and things like that. Yeah, obviously it wasn't like well, it got sober. Let's do OnlyFans. Like there was a bit before that. Like because um, it's interesting because the reason I bring it up is because most people dissociate sex work with the addiction. Just weird. They wouldn't yeah. see it as something you would do after mm. an addiction. Yeah. I Which is I'd just a really interested. unfair stereotype of sex work. No, like, but I would be interested. I know you're kind of just saying that to play devil's advocate, but I would be interested to know the grounds b- b- behind that. No, I, I truly would be interested because I hear that and, you know, uh, I don't, I don't quite understand. I respect the opinion, but I, I don't quite understand the grounds behind that. Like as in, you know, I think the stereotype like, of addiction is that, and I guess you see it, but like just with, especially with things like heroin and crack, mm. where generally men and women will steal or yeah. do sex work to pay for the habit. Yeah, right, get you. I think the truth is that those people usually become um, user dealers, I think they call it. I think that's more the truth. But mm. I think the visible bit that we see is the person you know, propositioning us, you know, you see like the kind of, you know, heroin addict woman yeah. offering you sex for a tent yeah. or something. Yeah. I think because you see it, you burn, it's burned into your brain. I see. Like quite often I get the, uh, the idea of uh, morality. Like mm-hmm. I'm supposed to be living a spiritual life. How can you, how can you feel emotionally comfortable with yourself if you're doing what you do? I get that one. Is um, it something you've questioned given what you've been through? No, I personally, I mean, people disagree, but whatever. Like, I personally, you know, I've been a, a teacher. I've been a website designer. I worked in an ice cream shop. Those are all little halo around your head jobs. Those are all good ice little cream moral jobs. my favorite one. Yeah, me too. I stole from the tills. I turned up drunk. Mm. I was irresponsible with young people. That's immoral. That's, that's to me, is that's immoral. Yeah. I do OnlyFans. I respect myself. I respect my clients. I don't scam. I don't lie. I don't cheat. I pay my taxes. I pay my staff well. And you're not doing something illegal. I'm not doing anything illegal. So to me, morality has got very little to do with what you do. Unless, of course, like you're a murderer. Um, You know, if that is a job title, like assassin or whatever. And people are doing this assumption that they're assuming... Because you do OnlyFans, that you're having sex with everybody. Yeah, th- that's a weird one as well. <laughs> because, like, you don't go up to, like, a doctor and think, like, as he's walking down the street on the way home, he's, like, taking people's, like, pulse. He's just a doctor. That's just his job. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. I mean, some people like having sex with loads of people. I personally actually don't. Like, yeah, I, I mean, I if you're a religious person, you would have, you know, you morally would be against that. Yeah. But they really struggle with OnlyFans models that are not having sex with everybody. Yeah. It's weird, it's like, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, in terms of like uh, the original thing, which is like, how can you be in, like, you know, recovery is not really associated with sex work and stuff like that. You know, as long as I'm not hurting anyone else or hurting myself, I can do what the fuck I want to do in recovery. If I want to go out and sleep with loads of dudes, I can do that. Like, I personally don't like doing that. Um, but do you find there's a link between the addiction that you went through with alcohol and drugs and um, say porn addiction and say, um, I'm going to call it sex addiction, Mm. but I think what I really mean is people that 
are insecure in themselves yeah. and they seek it by sleeping with as many people as they can, yeah. whether they're men or women. Yeah, I think like, again, like it's one of those things, it's not really what you do, it's how you're going about doing it and for what reason, Yeah. right? So, you know, I could be, I could be sleeping with like a load of guys and I could be genuinely doing, I could be examining this with like my, AA advising person or my therapist and we could figure out do you know what she's just doing that because she really enjoys it mm -hmm. that's cool if I'm sleeping with two people or one person and I'm doing it because of a deep need to feel uh accepted or loved or I'm once again looking outside myself for my internal uh needs so it's the same with OnlyFans like I do OnlyFans because I actually really enjoy creating the content mm -hmm. um And it's a good earner. It's a job. If I was doing OnlyFans because, again, like I want attention because that's the only way I feel loved, um, because I want to scam people and get money out of people, uh, you know, then yeah, it's not a recovered thing to do OnlyFans. It's kind of like it's a bit deeper than just your job title, you know? Yeah. Like, yeah. Mm. No, I completely get that. It makes sense. Some people will never get that. And some people will definitely disagree with that. But like, Well, I think it's just they're conflating those two things. Um, like, I think the morality part confuses a lot of people. Mm. I get why they're confused as well, because they're just assuming that you're doing OnlyFans because you need to do it rather than because you want to. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, yeah, I would like to say, yeah, I, I choose, like, I, I want to. Like I enjoy it. And some women, especially with something like OnlyFans. And they would say, the other counter argument that would have is like, okay, you're doing it because you enjoy it. But they would argue, oh, you are hurting other people because you're not just damaging your reputation. You're damaging, you know, your future children's reputation, your parents' reputation. But it's not something I agree with. Yeah. But that's like what they throw at you. Yeah. I mean, I've been a chronic addict and alcoholic for mm. most of my life. I think I've done my mum and dad enough. Like the, this is water off a duck's back. Yeah. My parents, like, you know, I think, you know, it's just one of those things, each their own and all that. But like, if you're that bothered about like what other people think of you, you're limiting yourself in so many ways. And if you're just going through life, just wondering who you're going to offend, what boring life you'll end up leading. Like if yeah. you're not really being true to yourself anyway. So if, if I'm making choices based on, you know, if it's going to ruin again, unless I'm like, you know, hurting someone or literally dropping them in the shit or like divulging their private information or, you know, it's nothing to, it's, I can't make my life choices like that. I have my happiness and my contentment. is actually like my priority. If I mm -hmm. want to stay sober and well, I'm going to do what makes me happy. Um, the one thing that I have come up a bit against a bit of like, ooh, juxtaposition with my job. Um, and this is just me being real and honest. Mm -hmm. And yeah, every now and again, I've got someone on my page, my OnlyFans page, who doesn't seem to have a very healthy relationship with my content or How, in what way? seeks more than just... Uh, Well, you said about porn, sex addiction. There's a there's groups for sex and love addiction. You know, I'm not saying that we're all in love, but that connection, they, they're going to the wrong place for 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 that. And I get people on there talking about, you know, there was a, someone on my page not long ago talking about this other cam girl. He'd spent thousands, thousands, and he she wouldn't even say hello to him and stuff like that. These kinds of things make me feel mm -hmm. really uncomfortable. Um, It's not the wisest business decision, but I, I've referred a couple of people to support groups. I, I um, think that's a good thing. Yeah, I um, mean, I, I I know porn addiction, sex addiction. They're not official addictions, but and I'm not an expert. But from what I've learned speaking to psychologists, is that like anything can become a mm. compulsive behaviour. Yeah. It can become harmful. Absolutely. And I think behavioral addictions like that. Um, It's like gambling. Yeah. Like, absolutely ravage people's lives. Completely. And I think with things like OnlyFans, I have heard stories mm -hmm. of men racking up credit card yeah. debts. And, 
Yeah, when you're doing that, I don't think you could call it anything but an addiction. Yeah. No, me neither. And I don't blame the models for that. And I don't blame the men doing it. But I don't know what the solution is for them. Yeah, I suppose it's like... Because there's so much shame over it. That's, Do you think it's hard to talk about alcoholism? Yeah. Try talking about yeah. I'm addicted well, to wanking. Well, yeah. It's like... Yeah, I mean, yeah, I've known people uh, who have been addicted to those things. And it, it, that's awful. Like, how horrible. Like, and it's so like, it's it's much more uh, insidious than alcohol and drugs, you know, like it's much more under the, under the surface. So, you know, it has made me quite uncomfortable when I've come across people that uh, I, I get that vibe from mm. um, more often than not people are literally there. They will probably just join for like whatever it is, $5 or something like that. Yeah. I think that's the most common. It's yeah. just like, they like you, they connect with you and they want to support you because of that. Yeah. No other reason. Because people are nice. Yeah. But yeah, now and again, you do get someone that you're like, hmm. And I wouldn't like to assume, so I don't do it w with everyone, but there definitely have been people that I will not uh, sell content to and I won't continue to, to I think it's the right with. approach. For years, I on my porn site, I'd always said, it's not a real addiction. It's like, not a problem. Ignore it. Um, but now I just have a page where it explains what it is, how to deal with it, where to get help. Yeah, and that's so cool. It's the most you can do yeah. because, you know, what is porn? Is porn um, Instagram? Like you can just mm. flick through Instagram, yeah. jerking off all day if you want. Well, yeah. And it's sexy as hell. Yeah. You don't need to take your clothes off to have um, a kind of porn addiction. Well, yeah. So yeah. I think you know, the most we can just the responsibility we have is just to make sure that there is help for people should they need it. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. It's the same, like, I, I, I uh, told you about, like, what was the turning point? And it was like, well, I was desperate and I had access to the right support. Mm. So I think it's that's correct. Like, I mean, what more can you do? Yeah, like, there is nothing. And it's so misunderstood, know, that I think. Cause it's such a, we've never been... Like there's no time in human history where gambling has been More so, so easy to yeah. access. Like you can just yeah. open your phone and start gambling. Yeah. And I think it's the same with porn um, and dating. So same with sex. If you want sex, you can just go hunting for it. Well, yeah. Like it's and, like a touch of a button. Like it's easier to get than cocaine. Like Yeah. <laughs> Like, maybe for girls yeah <laughs> yeah maybe a little bit more difficult yeah for me. i mean like only fans that you can go boom subscribe you have yeah, to wait 20 yeah. minutes for the dealer to come so like <laughs> in that sense like it's 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 quicker but i think like you know you, people do have the argument of like you know i put up these only fans billboards things and everyone's like no ban it you know no that shouldn't be allowed and my response is like when has that ever helped mm -hmm. when has that ever helped like you've seen it with like real life sex work you you criminalize something, you ban it. it. It doesn't make it go away. It yeah. just makes it really dangerous. You just put it in the hands of yeah. criminals. Yeah, and you just make it worse. It's the same with like, you know, addiction of any kind. The more you talk about it, the more you bring it out into the open and give people resources rather than ban the alcohol, it, you know, like the less shame people are going to feel and the more people are going to come forward. You ban the thing and people are just going to go find it anyway. It's just going to be, like made in bathtub rather than do you know what I'm saying? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I guess like to wrap up, um I was like kind of two questions on this theme really. Is if you could speak to your younger self, is there anything you would say to prevent you getting addicted? Ooh. Or is addiction just the journey you had to go on to be you? Perhaps, you know, when I was young, I was told about the big two, the crack and the heroin. Mm -hmm. And I was told to stay away from them too. That can really, yeah, uh, that you can get addicted to those. Um, maybe if there was a bit more knowledge about, you know, alcohol withdrawal can actually kill you, you know, <laughs> like, you, uh -huh. you know, you, you, can, you can get addicted to this. Maybe, although... I will say, and again, it, it sounds a bit sort of like trite, but 
I'm actually I'm grateful for my experience because I can relate to that. Yeah, but I just I have a level of compassion for other people that I don't think I would be able to have without going through some dark places. Yeah, a hundred percent. And you know, like we want to do all these things, don't we? Like you said, like you you got sober and you're suddenly going to the gym. You're working with a personal trainer. Like you're looking after your health. You want to do all that stuff. I liked, you know, I like personal development and. Mm-hmm. And meditation and things like that all oh, sounds great but without the oh god i need something to, mm-hmm. i need to change you don't do it so really i i've gained a hell of a lot from my experience i was just very lucky to have uh pulled it around yeah i yeah. wouldn't recommend people go through it to others <laughs> well it worked out well you don't you <laughs> definitely don't need to be an addict if you want to start meditating you can just start meditating i will say that or you can just yeah. go to the gym you, you it's cheaper than the well, there is this theory had. that people that have experienced the right level of trauma are the people that are successful in life because they have that motivation that's really interesting uh, apparently that's how the cia recruits they look right. for people Just that damaged. have had the right amount of damage if you have too right. much trauma you can't recover sure but also they think i don't know how true this is this yeah is like from a podcast i'm listening to that's interesting though <laughs> but, yeah i like that idea and I guess like just to completely wrap up, I we wanted you said quite a few times that you had this um like hole mm. to fill. Mm. Like did you manage to fill it and how? I think to be honest, like I'll always be doing things to 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 fill that further. Mm-hmm. Um but I think having this conversation, thinking that it could reach a couple of people. Yeah. Uh, when I'm able to make good of my experience with addiction, like if you share that with a person or in a group and someone benefits, um, that does it. You know, it's the, the little things that I was bypassing for the instant gratifications, like beautiful sunrise, um, cuddling my cats. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I always be a seeking person because I just enjoy, I, I like chasing something. I like just, oh, how about this? How about that? How about a meditation retreat? How about, you know? Well, that's our animal instinct, isn't Mm, it? And Maybe. The spiritual guidance is always to delay gratification. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Um, But it's usually the little things. It's just, um, you're filling it up with the wrong things. There's no space for that stuff anyway. So Mm. yeah, it's the small things. Yeah. That's good. I like it. Cool. I think you definitely help one person. Just, I mean, just for me, I mean, I've, Obviously, I'm not drinking anymore, but it's helped me a lot just talking. Because oh, awesome. how often do you get to have a conversation like this? It's not yeah, often. Like, so it's been very special for me, I must admit. Oh, and for me. So thank you. Thank you. Like, it's really nice to talk to someone who I know that gets it, probably most of it. Anyway, yeah, and our experiences you know. are so different and yet similar. Yeah. That's what's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, no, thank you so much. Now, I really, I really hope it helps some people as well. Me so, too. You know, if it does help or you have questions, just please write in the comments or I'm sure DM either of us. Yeah, 100%. Um, and you can tell people where to find you. And- oh, yeah. So my Instagram is Eliza Rose Watson. I'm the same on all platforms. Um, feel free to DM me or my email address is on my Instagram. Uh, you can see my website link there and that's all the other places to find me, like OnlyFans, etc. And I feel yeah. like you're going to get a lot of messages saying, I'm addicted and I need help. And then the next message is going to be, I'm addicted to you or something like that. Something something super cheesy. (laughs) Yeah. The stuff that comes through my email, I swear like that, that'd be quite a nice one. (laughs) 